Uh, welcome everyone to a, another one of the Learning Analytics Learning Networks uh, sessions. Uh, we have over the last several years, primarily uh, driven by uh, Justin, hosted probably 20, 30 different talks on different areas that I think provide valuable insights into first and foremost learning and educational processes, but at the same account through the work that we have done out of uh, UTA psychology department, we've also uh, focused more so on what role does data play in the new emerging ecosystem of methodologies and approaches that people take to trying to understand human conditions, uh, human behavior, and so on. And as a result of that area of focus, we've been devoting more time to understanding if data is part of an emerging set of methodologies, uh, how does it change how we're currently doing research? Now, for both Justin and I, we're doing this through the lens of the Master of Science Learning Analytics that we uh, run out of uh, UTA. But I think in other cases, we look at other centers, both more traditional psychology research, but also emerging big data, big science research approaches. Uh, that's only going to become more consequential. Uh, for example, I do a newsletter on uh, the effects of AI on learning and educational processes. And I was just looking at a uh, recent report from Walmart, which said that a number of years ago, they had maybe a dozen people working within AI within their organization. And now they've got a team of several hundred working in this area. And so if data becomes the currency of our modern era, then it's increasingly going to start to be a proxy that we use to understand human cognition, human knowledge processes, and so on. And so that's one of the primary intents of this type of an event. I'm going to just uh, say welcome to everybody that's here. Welcome to those who are going to catch the recording and throw it over to you, Justin. Thanks, George. Um, so I dropped a couple links if you're interested in checking out our, our program uh, that's there, as well as Learning Analytics Learning Network. We have a number of different events coming up, including um, a session in a couple weeks about Learning Analytics curriculum. And then we also have lots of different events on uh, um, like video-based learning analytics, as well as an open digital platform a collaboration um, effort that's uh, funded out of IES. Um, Jeremy, Rochelle, um, talking about that, CIRNET, if you haven't heard of that before. Um, so anyway, that'll be in September. So lots of different events. Make sure you check it out if, if you have an interest in this. But really, you're not here to hear from us. You're here to hear from Nicholas, and we're excited to have Nicholas here um, from Stanford. Um, Nicholas is a research scientist at Stanford University and co-director for the Stanford Big Team Science Lab, as well as director for the Psychological Science Accelerator. So Nicholas, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'll say that we can ask questions throughout the session. Please use the chat and just put it out there. And um, he said that there's some little natural breaks and we'll be able to answer questions throughout the session. All right, turning over. Thanks, George and Justin for that introduction. And it's actually very interesting for me to get a little bit of background knowledge on this as well. And before I sort of jump in, I kind of wanted to note what I think is going to be the main thesis of this talk and how it connects with other talks is that I think maybe one of the big takeaways from this talk is going to be that the pipeline between gathering data, using methods to gather data and analyzing those data and then arriving at a conclusion or what we might call truth with the capital T is far more complicated uh, than I at least originally imagined when I started this line of work. So. That's uh, what I think might be one of the big takeaways for today. But to get started into the actual talk, a few years ago, I read this very interesting play called Constellations. And in this play, it's originally in person, but you can read it now on, any, on the internet. What happens is the audience watches as this very unlikely romance evolves between a cosmologist named Marianne and a beekeeper named Roland. And throughout the play, the cosmologist Marianne talks very passionately about things like quantum mechanics and string theory, and most importantly for my talk today, multiverse theory. And eventually, the young beekeeper Roland has a revelation. And he states that in the quantum multiverse, every choice we've ever and never made exists in an unimaginably vast ensemble of parallel universes. Now, this play, of course, is fictional. It's perhaps a bit hyperbolic. But today, I'm going to argue that Roland's idea about the multiverse is not fictional. And that this multiverse may not just characterize reality, but also the tool that we use to try to understand reality, which is data collection and data analysis or science. 
So I'm going to argue that just like our cosmologist Marianne, we too make many choices in our research endeavors, and that these choices have important consequences for the scientific inferences that we make. And I'm going to argue that one of the ways that we can try to address this so-called multiverse problem is through big team science. And then I'll show you all a few examples of what that looks like. So first I wanna talk about this phrase, science multiverse problem. And I'm going to call it the multiverse because other people have described it that way. But I also wanna point out that you might've heard this be referred to as the random effects problem or the generalizability crisis. So like many things, that goes by many names. And so as an example of this multiverse problem, I want to invite you to imagine a typical study in psychology. And we can keep in mind that not all studies look like this, but we can use it as an easy example. And so let's say that the scientist in our story, Marianne, is interested in testing some psychological theory. If this is a typical psychology study, she would first derive some sort of hypothesis about how the world works. To test that hypothesis, she would then design a study. She would then run that study, process and analyze her data, and then form some sort of conclusion. If Mary Ann was a typical psychologist, she might then write a paper or a white report about her conclusion. And she would assume in her writing that she's discovered something reliable and psychologically interesting about the world. But Mary Ann isn't the typical psychologist because if you remember from the story, she's actually quite familiar with the notion of a multiverse. And so she realizes that there were many predictions that she could have derived to test her theory of interest. And that for each one of those predictions, there's many studies that she could have designed. And for each one of those studies that she designed, there's many different ways that she could have gone about executing the study. And that for each one of those study executions, there's many different ways that she could have processed her data and modeled her data. And so if we wanted to quantify this, we would say that the size of Marianne's science multiverse is the number of reasonable predictions she could have derived multiplied by the number of reasonable studies she could have designed multiplied by the number of reasonable ways she could have ran that study, multiplied by the number of ways she could have processed and analyzed her data. And if we assume just as a very simple example that there's only five reasonable ways that she could have done each one of those things, the size of her multiverse would be 625. Yet Marianne merely occupies one of those realities. And this raises an important question. Given the sheer size of Marianne's science multiverse, to what extent should we believe that her conclusion about the world is actually reliable? And this depends on how consequential those decisions in the multiverse were. And so we'll explore that next. And for the sake of time, I'm going to focus just on the design of studies and the execution of studies and data processing and data analysis. So I'll start with design of studies. In 2020, Landy and colleagues published a paper where they had 15 research teams design a study to test the exact same research question. So one of those research questions was whether people explicitly self-report that they possess a negative automatic association with a negatively stereotyped social group. So this is a very important research question for bias reduction research and prejudice research. And it's an important question. A lot of people are interested in it. And not surprisingly, there's many reasonable ways that one might go about answering that research question. And what they found is that the research groups took some slightly different approaches. So one of the teams showed participants an image of a negatively stereotyped social group in the US and then asked the participants if they were personally aware of any immediate gut level reaction using a Likert type scale. That seems reasonable. Another team asked participants a dichotomous question about whether they were aware of a personal 
automatic negative association with ethnic minorities broadly defined. That also seemed reasonable. Yet another team used a Likert scale question and asked participants if they believe that people in general can have unconscious negative automatic associations. That's also a reasonable approach. And then participants were randomly assigned to complete one version of each one of those very reasonable study designs. And this is what they found. I'm gonna orient you to this graph. The x-axis is Cohen's D, which is a standardized effect size estimate. And for today's purposes, just think of zero as being roughly equivalent to saying that participants neither agreed nor disagreed with the idea that they possess negative automatic associations. So some of the methods that these researchers designed indicated that participants were quite aware of their negative automatic associations. That's a very interesting finding to me. But then some of the other methods indicated that participants were quite unaware of their negative automatic associations. And when you look at all the studies, you find a lot of variability. And this variability exceeds what we would expect from sampling error alone. So this is the analysis that they used was called a meta-analysis. Meta-analyses often include an I-squared statistic, which is the proportion of variability that's driven by something other than sampling error. And in this scenario, the I-squared statistic indicated that about 1% of this variability was sampling error alone. The rest of it was driven by meaningful differences in how people design their studies. So study design matters in the science multiverse. Well, let's assume though that you only chose one study design and you just ran that same study multiple times. Does that matter? Well, this is a very popular paradigm in psychology right now. We call them mini lab studies. And one of them uh, that's somewhat recent is by Rick Klein and colleagues. And in this study, they took 28 original research studies and then had 62 teams run direct replications of that original study. So in the visualization of their results, the original study effect size is denoted with a triangle, and then the replication effect sizes are denoted with tick marks. So for this discussed sensitivity study, the original study found a very large effect, and the 62 replications yielded a distribution of effects that were centered around zero. And the distribution is pretty wide, but I think that that might be because they had somewhat small sample sizes. And I know it seems like a lot of variability, but actually in this instance, this is what you would expect from sampling error alone. The I squared statistic is pretty close to zero. But when you look at all of the studies that they replicated, 40% of the time, the observed variability exceeded what you would expect from sampling error alone. So that would be a large I squared statistic one that differs from zero. And what this is suggesting is that if you run the same exact study more than once, you can incidentally introduce meaningful differences that somewhat change the pattern of results. Mostly in this scenario, it's changing the size of the effect that you're estimating. So there isn't a reversal, but it's still changing the estimate. So the way you design your study matters. Apparently the way that you execute the study matters. But this, a lot of people here are interested in data science. So let's think a little bit about how we process the data and analyze the data, assuming that we have a single design, assuming that we ran the study in a single location. And one of the studies that I really like on this is by Silverzon and colleagues. What they did is they gave 29 research teams the exact same data set and asked them to evaluate whether dark skinned soccer players are more likely than their light skinned counterparts to receive a red card. And I know there's a lot of sports in Arlington, um, but I don't know how popular soccer is. Red card is a huge deal in soccer. And so if there is a bias in how red cards are being handed out, that could be potentially very consequential for how that game is played. And so these 29 teams have the same data set and they get to analyze it however they want. Here's what the results look like. On the y-axis, we basically have an odds ratio. Up here, dark-skinned players are four times more likely than light-skinned players to receive a red card. Over here is that they're equally likely, and then down here is that they're less likely to receive a red card. We also uh, use red and gray dots to denote whether the estimated effect size is statistically significant with an alpha of 0.05. So with these two research groups here, you can see that they both estimated that dark-skinned players were about three times more likely 
to receive a red card. But only in one of the scenarios was the estimate statistically significant. So this team over here clearly chose an analysis strategy um, that had a lot of unexplained variability. Maybe it incorporated a lot of uh, sources of uncertainty into its effect size estimate. And so even though its estimate was very similar, the statistical significance of it was different. When you look at all of the teams, you see that the results ranged from estimating that dark skinned players were 11% less likely to receive a red card up to them being 300% more likely to receive a red card. And in 70% of these cases, the estimates were statistically significant and in 30% of the cases, they were not. So that's one case study. Is it maybe just an exception? Well, no, it seems like there are a lot more of these case studies emerging every single day. So a similar study was recently conducted by Botvinnik Netzer and colleagues. And this was in the field of neuroscience. And they wanted to test the hypothesis regarding neural activity during decision-making under risk. So they had a massive data set and they gave it to 70 teams. And what they found is that no two teams chose identical data analysis workflows. And for simplicity, they grouped their data analysis strategies across teams into three clusters that varied in the probability of supporting the hypothesis that was being tested. And as you can see here, the research question doesn't matter so much as the general pattern here. The hypothesized pattern of results or of neural activation rather differed across these three clusters. And so some, some research teams were suggesting that it looked more like this, and other research teams were suggesting that it looked more like this. What's even more surprising to me is that the teams reported high confidence, not only in their own results, but in the idea that the other research teams would find something similar. And that's why I really like this paper by both Nick Netzer, because it reminds me of the revelation of that young beekeeper, Roland, who at one point in the story was constrained by the reality of his own universe, only to later realize that he exists in a vast ensemble of parallel universes. So to make it a little bit more concrete, differences in how we design our studies and run our studies and process our data and analyze our data matter. And so if you wanted to speak metaphorically, you could say that we live and exist in a science multiverse, but that we're often unaware of it. We often put too much confidence in our conclusions and fail to realize that those things mattered, that we could have designed the study differently and we could have analyzed our data differently. So that's the multiverse problem. I'm gonna stop here for a moment in case there's any questions, but if there's not, or if you wanna wait for questions, I'll save maybe 10, 15 minutes at the end. Um, so Justin, I haven't been watching the chat. I'm not sure if there's anything there. Uh, nothing yet. Okay. So I'll keep on moving, but if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and I can stop later or we can chat all the way at the end. So this multiverse problem reminds us of how constrained our scientific insights can be. So in an attempt to expand those insights, my colleagues and I have been working on building up big team science, which is scientific endeavors where an unusually large number of researchers come together in pursuit of a common goal. And so one example of this kind of work is a group that I direct called the Psychological Science Accelerator. The Psychological Science Accelerator is a globally distributed network of researchers who pool their intellectual and their material resources in order to run very big studies that help us generate generalizable knowledge in psychology. So you could think of this as like big data in experimental psychology. And over the past few years, we've begun to build the collaborative infrastructure that we feel we need in order to explore this so-called multiverse problem. And I would say that at this stage, we're merely at the edge of that multiverse, but what we have found so far has been really interesting. So I'm gonna share a few of our projects and then I'll tell you a little bit more about maybe some future work we'll do. So I'm gonna start with our first ever study. In social psychology, it's widely accepted that people quickly and involuntarily form impressions of others based on their facial appearances. 
the moment that you joined the Zoom call, you saw my face and you made some sort of judgment about the kind of person that I am. What we wanted to know is how are people doing that? So one of the more popular theoretical models in this literature suggests that there are many judgments that we make, but that these have a more simple underlying structure that boils down to evaluations of trustworthiness and evaluations of dominance. So things like judgments of attraction and judgments of intelligence can actually be explained as a combination of an evaluation of trustworthiness and an evaluation of dominance. So like many psychology theories, it's been assumed that this idea is capturing some sort of universal psychological process. But the problem is that the model was developed using data from mostly Western participant samples. So what we wanted to do was examine the cross-cultural generalizability of this theor theoretical model. And to do so, we performed a global replication. So in this scenario, we had the same theory derived prediction. We had the same design, which meant that we had people view a variety of pictures of faces and then rate them on things like attractiveness, aggression, and intelligence in order to determine whether those traits can actually just be uh, characterized as a combination of a dominant and trustworthy judgment. We then ran the study on approximately 12,000 participants in 41 countries which we class, uh, categorized into 11 different world regions. We then used two major data analysis strategies, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then formed an overall conclusion, which we then published in the paper. So we started by using the same principal component analysis strategy used in the original study. This is a pretty popular uh, method in data science. And when we did that, we found the theoretical model generalized pretty well across the 11 world regions. What this is suggesting is that even though people made ratings using words like intelligence and attraction, we could explain most of those ratings by just focusing on two simpler ideas of dominance and trustworthiness. And this generally replicated pretty well across world regions, although there was some variability, right? In Eastern Europe, it wasn't perfect. But overall, if you just looked at this analysis strategy, you would declare it a huge success as far as uh, the theory's ability to make cross-cultural predictions. But then we use an alternative data analysis strategy that we had pre-registered because we thought that it would improve upon some of the limitations of the original strategy. So we use an exploratory factor analysis, which has some different assumptions than a principal components analysis. And when we used this approach, we found that the theoretical model didn't replicate very well across world regions. We found that the underlying structure of these social judgments appeared to vary across world regions. People were evaluating these faces in a different way, depending on where they were located in the world. So this work has some implications for understanding how people make social judgments across cultures. But this work also highlighted how the multiverse problem is multiplicative. So remember I said that it's the amount of predictions multiplied by the number of designs multiplied by the study execution. This provides evidence for that assertion because if we limited ourselves to just one analysis strategy, things looked okay. But the moment that we turned to a different analysis strategy, things didn't look very consistent across cultures. And this idea of the multiplicative nature of the multiverse problem is important because you can imagine that it generalizes to other contexts. You can imagine that there are some study designs that are highly replicable across world regions and other study designs that are not, even if they're testing the same hypothesis. You can imagine that some psychological processes that we want to study are highly stable across world regions and highly stable across situations, and that maybe some are not. And this is the kind of stuff that can lead to decades, maybe even centuries, of debate in science. But when we work together and pool our resources and explore how these things matter, how differences in design matter and how differences in data processing matter, what we can do is accelerate the pace of that discussion and, and make multiple years of progress in just a single study. So that was our first study. 
I'll move on to our next project, which is called the Many Smiles Collaboration. The Many Smiles Collaboration is a global adversarial team of researchers who came together to conduct a foundational test of facial feedback theory. So for those who aren't social psychologists or aren't emotion researchers, the facial feedback hypothesis refers to the idea that sensory motor feedback from our facial expressions can causally impact the conscious experience of emotion. Put more simply, it means that if you smile, you'll feel happier, and if you frown, you'll feel sad. Those who have been following this line of research very well know that this is controversial. And when we started this project back in 2016, researchers were debating whether this effect is valid in the first place, because a very seminal demonstration of the effect where participants reported more happiness when they held a pen in their mouth in a manner that forced smiling didn't replicate. And so this was a textbook demonstration that the effect exists and it didn't replicate very well. So to move the conversation forward, my team formed the Many Smiles Collaboration. And what this is, was a adversarial collaboration where we brought together theory proponents and theory skeptics or critics, and some people who don't care about the theory but are interested in the methods. And we brought them together into a single collaboration and said, we want you to articulate your theoretical perspective regarding when facial feedback effects, if real, should most reliably emerge. Tell us how we can get this effect to work. Then let's work together to develop an experiment that will not only test those conditions, but also help resolve whatever disagreements we encounter along the way. And once we've designed that test, let's run it on a global scale. So the collaboration began with a very simple question. Does posing happy expressions cause people to feel happier? And one of our first notable findings is that if you ask a simple question to a large adversarial team of researchers, you don't get a simple answer whatsoever. And so we found that there were three major disagreements here. First, researchers disagreed about whether the facial pose had to resemble a natural expression of happiness in order to impact feelings of emotion. Okay. They disagreed about whether the facial poses could initiate feelings of happiness if the situation was otherwise non-emotional, or if it alternatively could only amplify ongoing feelings of happiness. And last, the researchers disagreed about whether an effect that we would observe would be merely driven by things like placebo effects and demand characteristics, which is a very legitimate methodological concern in this literature. So we wanted to design a test that would address all these questions in some way. To test whether posing happy expressions caused people to feel happier, we had participants pose happy and neutral expressions in random order. To test whether the expressions can initiate feelings of happiness in an otherwise not emotional context versus merely amplify ongoing feelings of happiness, we manipulated whether they looked at happy photos while they completed these poses. So if facial feedback can only amplify ongoing feelings of happiness, we should only see an effect when participants are looking at positive pictures of puppies and rainbows and butterflies. Next, we wanted to look at whether the method of eliciting the happy versus neutral pose matters. And of course, if you remember, some people said that you needed a natural expression of happiness. So to create a more natural expression of happiness, we had some participants mimic photos of actors who were displaying highly realistic expressions of happiness. So for those of you who study facial expressions, uh, you know that a genuine expression of happiness often involves the orbicularis oculi, the crinkling of the eyes. And so this actor is displaying a highly realistic expression of happiness because there's the crinkling of the eyes in addition to the smiling activation over here. Of course, we wanted to create some less natural expressions of happiness. And so to do that, we simply asked some participants to move their lips back towards their ears. So you get the lip movement, you don't get the teeth showing, and you don't get much activation in your orbicular wrist oculi. And last, we wanted to compare those results to the recent failure to replicate, the study where they had participants hold a pen in their mouth in a manner that forced smiling. So we had some participants complete this controversial facial feedback task. So all the collaborators in this study agreed that these sets of conditions provided 
foundational test of facial feedback theory. So we then had the 26 labs collect data from about 3,900 participants spanning 19 countries. And I'll note ahead of time that we found very little between country variability. The results from data that we collected in the US looked very similar to Australia, which looked very similar to Kenya. So I'm gonna focus on simple fixed effects that represent the global pattern of results here. And the results are graphed in a way that roughly mimics the experiment design matrix. So we have self-reported happiness on the y-axis and facial expression pose on the x-axis. We have separate columns for each of the facial feedback tasks, facial mimicry, voluntary facial, pen and mouth. And then we have separate rows for whether positive stimuli are present. So I'm first gonna focus on the effects of smiling in the facial mimicry task in the presence of positive stimuli. And so what this is telling us is whether a high quality happiness pose can amplify ongoing feelings of happiness. As you can see here, we found that it could. Participants reported feeling higher levels of happiness when they were posing a happy versus a neutral expression. Next, we looked at whether this same task could initiate feelings of happiness in an otherwise neutral context, no positive images being shown. And we found that it could. We found the same pattern of results in the task where participants posed relatively lower quality expressions of happiness. This is the condition where they merely pulled their lips back towards their ear. And so this suggested that the high quality poses are not strictly necessary for facial feedback effects to emerge. Last, there was the replication of that controversial pin and mouth test. Contrary to a lot of our predictions, we didn't find much evidence of a facial feedback effect in this condition. That being said, let's think about the multiverse problem for a moment. It depended on how we process the data and how we analyze the data. So the analysis that we had originally planned to do did not yield much evidence. But I'll note that if we loosened our inclusion criteria, to include people who said that they didn't finish the task very well or said that they were distracted. If we allowed anyone into the data set, we actually did find some evidence. And so once again, data processing, data analysis matters. So what's important here, like with most of the studies I'm gonna discuss, is not the theory or the findings, but the collaboration structure. So we had several predictions and to test those predictions, we designed several studies. And then we combined all those different studies into one very large study and decided to collect just a lot of data on that one mega study. We then executed the study in multiple regions, which didn't turn out to matter, and then ran a variety of data analysis procedures, which did end up mattering, and then published an extremely nuanced conclusion. And what was nice about this is that at the end of the project, one of the more senior collaborators remarked that it felt like we had made over a decade's worth of progress in just a few years. And they felt that way because they knew that we could have spent years debating whether facial feedback can initiate versus amplify feelings. We could have spent years arguing about whether you need a high quality versus a low quality pose, but we were able to accelerate that discussion by pooling our resources and engaging in big team science. So that's the Mini Smiles collaboration. I'm gonna talk about one more study today, which examined the effects of different ways of framing health information about COVID-19. So very early in the pandemic, we decided that we were going to expose some participants to lost framed health messages that emphasized the negative consequences of not adhering to WHO health recommendations. We then exposed some other participants to game framed messages that emphasized the benefits of following the WHO health recommendations. After exposing participants to these messages, we asked them whether they intended to engage in protective behaviors like masking. This was very early on in the pandemic. Masking was even more controversial back then than it is now. We asked them if they supported public policies that were designed to protect against COVID-19, such as mask mandates and vaccine mandates. And we asked them if they wanted more information about COVID-19. This was very early on in the pandemic. We were still wiping down the mail with Clorox wipes because we didn't know how the virus spread yet. So this was a time 
where people should have wanted a lot more information about COVID-19. And what was interesting is this project wasn't just about figuring out how we should communicate this health information. It also allowed us to test some competing predictions. So if you read the negativity bias research, you would come away with the prediction that loss framing should increase these outcomes. Losses loom larger than gains. And so if you tell people what's going to happen if they don't do this, they're going to be more likely to support your policies and adhere to your recommendations. But some of our collaborators were in the health message framing literature. And he said in their literature, they've often found that loss framing decreases these outcomes. That if you emphasize the consequences of not following the recommendations, you can alienate people, you can scare them, you can cause them to disengage from your message. And that can cause loss framed messages to be less effective than the gain framed messages, which are more positive. So we got to test some competing predictions. And then as a secondary outcome, I'm an emotions researcher, we measured self-reported anxiety. And we didn't really have an a priori prediction about anxiety, but we thought that it would be important to weigh the potential benefit, beneficial effects of message framing against the cost that it might have on people's anxiety. So that's why we included that measure there. So to put this back in the multiverse theory framework, we started with two competing predictions. Then we designed a test that we thought would be somewhat generalizable. So we didn't want to design a version of the loss and gain frame messages that was oddly specific and then find a result that would have differed if we would have worded things slightly differently. We knew that after this study was done, the media would take our recommendations and add a little bit of their own spin and word things a little bit differently. We wanted to incorporate that into the design rather than talk about it as a future direction or a limitation. So we consulted a journalist and we asked them to show us how they would write these lost framed and gain framed messages in the real world. And then we chose three of them and tested all three of them together. We then ran the study in 84 countries and analyzed the data in a few hundred ways and then published, as usual, a pretty nuanced conclusion. So here's a summary of what we found. Contrary to predictions from both the negativity bias and the health messaging literatures, we didn't find that message framing impacted behavioral intentions to engage in COVID-19 related protective behaviors. So what we have in this graph is an effect size index on the x-axis. And positive values indicate that the loss framed messages increased whatever outcome is listed here on the top panel. And the dotted line means no effect. We have some country specific dashes over here, which I'll review later, but for now focus on the overall effect size estimate at the bottom, which is in gold. And you can see here that the overall effect size estimate was close to zero and overlapped with zero. And this was despite the fact that we had a very large sample size of over 30,000 participants. So in this scenario, we concluded that we didn't have evidence that this message framing manipulation was changing behavioral intentions, despite the fact that two different literatures in psychology were predicting some effect. We found the same thing when it came to support for public policies designed to stop the spread of COVID-19. No effect, overlaps with zero. We also didn't observe that this message framing impacted people with propensity to seek information about COVID-19. That was also very surprising. And it's surprising because it's so close to zero, it almost just looks like it's on the dotted line. So that was a very close to zero estimate. When we look at the between country variability, we observe almost none of it. And I know that you can see some variability here, right? This looks a little bit different than that. But if you look at this variability, it is what you would expect from sampling error alone. The I squared statistic that I discussed earlier is very close to zero here, suggesting that this is a sampling error. We also didn't find that the way that we worded the messages mattered. Results were consistent across message wording. So we then turned our attention to data processing and data analysis differences. So the goal here wasn't to specify which data processing and analysis approach we thought was best because that's a hard thing to do. What we wanted to do instead was simulate the data analysis approaches that we thought other people might reasonably use. So as an example, we had a four item measure of behavioral intentions. And some people in the collaboration said that they would actually prefer to look at each item separately 
because maybe they're somewhat conceptually distinct. Whereas other people said, no, I think I would just average the items together and analyze just the average. So we did it both ways. We also used a few different approaches to modeling the data. And the actual models don't matter that much, but in case you're curious, we did a simple non-parametric man win EU test. We used a very simple linear regression. And then we used some mixed effects models that either included random intercepts, random slopes, or random intercepts and random slopes. And if you don't know what these different data analysis strategies mean, that's okay because it's not really necessary to understand that for the point I'm gonna to make today. So we had some different approaches for modeling the data and some different approaches for handling outliers. So sometimes we included everyone in the data. Sometimes we excluded people who are slight outliers. Sometimes we excluded only people who are extreme outliers. And then we also looked at a few different ways that we could handle responses to a manipulation check item. Sometimes including everybody regardless of how they responded. Sometimes included people who got it somewhat right but not perfectly right and then some people who perfectly passed the manipulation check items. And so in total, when you cross the outlier decisions and the manipulation check decisions and how you want to operationalize the dependent variable decisions and how you want to model the data decisions, when you cross all four of those things, you have 225 different data analysis strategies. And for simplicity today, this figure is just gonna categorize the analysis strategy based on whether it yielded a p-value of less than 0.05. I'm also going to show you instances where the models fail to converge. So if you're very into linear mixed effects modeling, you realize that models often fail to converge. And when they fail to converge, it actually tells you something pretty important about the structure of the data. So what we have over here is a result from a random intercept, random slope mixed effect model with data from all participants, regardless of whether they were an outlier or past manipulation checks. And so you can see for two of the items, the models fail to converge, which is informative. For one of the items, we found a significant effect. And then for another one of the items, we did not find a significant effect. And for the average of all of the items, we did not find a significant effect. And when you look at this for all of the hundreds of data analysis approaches, you find a pattern and you look at this overall pattern and you say, it doesn't look like we have reliable evidence of a message framing effect. Sure, we can sometimes find it in some of the analysis strategies, but in most of them, we don't. And so at the very least, we would claim that the results aren't robust to differences in data processing and data analysis strategies. Of course, you've probably been taught right now to not just focus on the p-values. We should also look at the magnitude of the estimated effect, which isn't shown in this figure. But I'll tell you that if you did look at the magnitude, you would find that even when the effect is statistically significant, the size of the estimated effect is quite negligible. And so we were able to conclude that regardless of how you process and analyze the data, you're probably going to come away with the conclusion that there is either little or no effect of framing, message framing manipulations on intentions to engage in COVID-19 protective behaviors. And that was the general story for all four of our main outcomes of interest. The one place where things differed is just so happens to be the place where I was most excited about the result, which is self-reported anxiety. We found that globally, when you frame messages in terms of losses, people become a little anxious. That's very exciting for an emotions researcher like me. And we found that the results were very similar across countries. So that also is sort of interesting, right? When you tell people that they're going to potentially die if they don't wear a mask, everyone gets a little nervous. And not surprisingly, in hindsight, this effect was really robust across different data processing and data analysis strategies. So to summarize all of this activity, we found that the COVID-19 message framing manipulations had little to no effect on the primary outcomes of interest, which was behavioral intentions and policy support and information seeking. But we found that it had a very reliable effect on anxiety. Framing these messages in terms of losses isn't going to people, isn't going to make people support your policies. It's not going to make them more likely to wear a mask, but it is going to make them feel a little anxious. And so you can take that into your consideration as a health um, communicator, whether you want that increase in anxiety or not. And what's nice about this approach of looking at multiple ways that we can write the message, looking at multiple countries where we collect data, looking at multiple ways of processing and analyzing data, is that we're able to very confidently 
state these conclusions. We can more be, be more confident in the generalizability of these results, which I think is very useful when you're dealing with something like a rapidly evolving pandemic. So that's what the psychological science accelerator does. We have about 12 studies somewhere in the pipeline right now. Some of them are just beginning. Some of them are getting close to finishing. And he, what each one of these studies is doing in some way is helping us address the science multiverse problem. So the three studies I reviewed today provide a flavor of what we're doing, but I wanted to end with a few slides that talk about what you could briefly do to address this problem. And I think that the simplest thing you can do is acknowledge the multiverse, both as a producer and a consumer of science. And what this means is that when you are designing a study or finishing a study, that you consider how differences in study design and study execution and data processing and data analysis might matter. You just at least think about the fact that it might matter. That's the least that you can do. And if you at least think about it, then I think that would naturally lead you to communicate a little bit more uncertainty um, and talk a little bit more about the limitations of a single study. Another thing you can do is explore the multiverse you can test multiple operationalizations of a research question in a single study if you can collect a large enough sample. You can collect data from diverse sources if you have the resources to do it. So maybe you run some participants online and some in person. You collect data in different countries, different situations, different uh, companies and industries. And another thing that you can do is you can model the uncertainty. So if you like to use multi-level models, you can include things like the way that your stimuli are worded and the area in which the data are collected as a source of uncertainty. And you can quantify the extent to which that matters for your conclusions. You can have many data analysts look at your results or your data rather and process it and analyze it how they want to so that you can see whether they're finding similar results as you are. And if you don't have a lot of data analysts sitting around, you could just do it yourself. And you can run sensitivity analyses where you consider different data processing pipelines, you consider different analytic approaches. Another thing that you can do is join a big team science collaboration. And so if you're interested in the psychological science accelerator, anyone can join at any career stage. And you can contribute to things like data collection and data analysis and community organization and project management. So that's always an option and you can reach out to me about that if you're interested. I'll also know Want, uh, rather note that you can propose a study for us to run. So right now we have an open call for study. Um, and so if it's anything related to the dynamics of religion change, intellectual humility, religious cognition, anything listed here, we want to hear your study idea. And if we like it, we will offer you $4,000 and the strength of our organization to help you run that really big study, to help you explore the science multiverse. And so that submission deadline is July 20th, and you can learn more by going, uh, Googling Psychological Science Accelerator and going to our website. You can also email me directly if you have questions. So I can talk more about that later, but I wanted to leave at least a few minutes for questions and conversation. So I'll wrap things up here. By being here today, or by watching the Zoom call, you've fundamentally changed the reality that you occupy. So you can imagine, a parallel universe where you skip this talk to go grab a talkie, a uh, coffee, or work on a paper, or anything else that might have interested you in that moment. And you didn't do that though, right? You're watching this right now. And so the universe that you currently occupy is different than the one that you would have occupied if you didn't come to this talk. That's pretty crazy. So moving forward, I hope you'll continue to realize that you're making a dizzying array of decisions every single day. And when you combine those decisions in a multiplicative fashion, you can imagine drastically different scientific inferences. You can imagine living a drastically different life if you would have done things differently. You can imagine a drastically different impact on the world that you occupy. So as you move forward in life and as you navigate those decisions, I hope that you'll keep this multiverse problem in mind. I hope that you'll be humble with your scientific conclusions. And I hope that you'll work together with your peers and your collaborators in our collective quest toward knowledge. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we have 
a little bit of time for questions and answers and conversations, I hope. Thanks, Nicholas. A lot to, uh, to think about and chew on, definitely. Um, if you have, um, especially I assume at this point, we can just uh, open up the mics too, if you'd like to just. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's way I'm doing it rather than just using the chat right now. Yeah, sure. Jared. Hi there. Hey. Uh, great presentation, really clear. Thanks for, for doing that. I hadn't heard that perspective before. Uh, I'm, I'm Jared Kenworthy, by the way. I'm fellow social psychologist. Um, so I've been, I'm not an emotion researcher per se, but I, you know, I teach a grad course on social and I spend a lot of time on this uh, emotion stuff. Uh, and one of the questions I've got for you is whether you have plans to do another version of, you know, something that's had trouble replicating over the years, which depends on analytical strategies and study design which is the, the facial recognition across culture. Do you have, have plans to do something like that on a large scale? Because I think that'd be pretty cool. We, we do. Um, I'm not leading that initiative, but Lisa DeBrian, who's at uh, University of Glasgow, I believe, um, has sort of formed a, a new collaboration where they want to do everything facial perception related. And so it's going to be sort of like the psychological science accelerator, but laser focused on face perception research. And so cross-cultural recognition um, is one of the things that they want to very much look at. Um, another person who has been sort of dabbling in that area is David March, who um, was actually my lab mate in graduate school um, and is now an assistant professor at Florida State University. Um, but him and I have been talking about um, starting to uh, develop the paradigms and um, create the, the stimuli that we would need uh, to run a massive study like this. So it's very early in the work I would say, but it's definitely something that many of us are very interested in. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And I have a second question sort of related to this, unless I don't see any other hands up. Um, Four is yours. And so in your, your many smiles thing with the facial feedback stuff, um, you mentioned that this was an adversarial collaboration, which I think is a good idea. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the first things I thought of that you actually mentioned was uh, dealing with the, you know, the placebo and the demand. How, how did you manage that? And if you didn't, it doesn't have the potential to sort of exacerbate the problems across the entire multiverse, right? Is anyone standing back outside the multiverse and saying, okay, you, you've got demand issues going all through these, you know, post yeah. issue. What, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I should have touched upon that a little bit. I, I, I mentioned it in the slide and I never returned to it. Um, first of all, I do want to acknowledge that sort of like broad, more like meta point, which is that yeah, big team science can lead to huge waste in resources. If you run a really bad study on a massive scale, you've just run an even bigger mess. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I want to kind of acknowledge that point of like mega mistakes happen when you do big team science. Whereas when you're running small scale stuff, you can make a few mistakes, run a few bad studies, no problem. Um, in this study, we had one primary way that we tried to do this, which is that we developed a cover story where we told people that we were actually interested in the effects of physical movements on mathematical performance. And so participants engaged in a variety of like silly filler tasks in addition to the smiling and the neutral pose. And so most of the time they were doing things like tap your leg once per second, um, touch your ear once per second. Um, and in some of those trials, they actually posed a facial expression. So we had that cover story. And then we had a funnel debriefing where we asked participants a variety of questions about what they think the purpose of the study was. And for the results that I shared today, those were only from participants who uh, filled out the debriefing form and were judged by two independent coders to be completely unaware of the purpose of the study. If you include the people who seem somewhat aware of the purpose of the study, the effects get bigger, which suggests that demand characteristics and placebo demand, matter. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I'll tell you one more thing, Jared, because this paper just came out and I'm very excited about it. Um, a few of us started running some smaller studies on the side, uh, and it, they just got published in JPSP, where we manipulated demand characteristics. And so we brought people, we ran the same exact paradigm, we dropped the cover story, and then we told some people we thought the effect was real, and we wanted to prove that the effect was real, and we told other people that we thought the effect was not real, and that we wanted to prove that it's totally bunk. And we found that those instructions very much moderated the facial feedback effect, but even the participants 
who were told that we wanted to prove that the hypothesis is false, even those participants exhibited more happiness after smiling and more anger after scowling. Oh, so you have the negatives. Yeah, I was going to ask if you did anything on the, you know, negative, negative emotions, negative persuasion type stuff. Yeah, not in the mini smiles collaboration, uh, but in the follow up study, we yeah we looked at the scowling, and then we also ran um, a few more studies where we measured participants' beliefs a few weeks before they took the study, and so we didn't manipulate demand characteristics anymore. We just measured beliefs beforehand, and we also found that participants who strongly believed that these effects are not real still felt happier after smiling and angrier after scowling. So I know I'm talking a lot about those results, but they just came out in JPSB last week. And so I'm like really excited to tell people more about it. And I just didn't have time in the presentation today to do so. Yeah, that's cool. It sounds like there's a parallel that Brad Bushman did with the catharsis hypothesis a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll stop talking. Thank you very much. I Thanks for the questions, Jared. Those are super interesting. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? We have about another minute or so. I'll note maybe while someone's typing in a question or um, trying to get the courage to, to you know, unmute. Uh, if you do have questions and you're watching this later on Zoom, um, the recording, or uh, you just don't want to talk right now, uh, you can email me. It's my email is n-c-o-l-e-s, in coles, at stanford.edu. And uh, I actually answer all of my emails. It, it is a problem. I should probably spend less time on email, but I don't know why. I just respond to all of them. So if you email me a question, it might take me a few days, but you will get a response because I, I really like this work and I enjoy talking about it. So, yeah. I can attest that Nick will be very responsive, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I'm not lying. <laughs> I don't know how you find time to do it all, but yeah, more power to <laughs> Not teaching, that's why. Oh, yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't have a teaching load right now, so I have a little bit more time for email. Yeah. And I have less student emails to, to go through, which when I was teaching was, was a very big proportion of my inbox. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not seeing anything else right now, so I'm assuming that I'll come later. And um, I guess for those um, that uh, you know, are attending, definitely make sure to share with your colleagues. Um, it's going to be uh, the recording, sorry, will be actually I'm not there. I think it's the wrong one. Sorry about that. This is the URL. I'm going to put it in the chat and I'll make sure to share it on the website as well. But um, yeah, uh, definitely check that out and make sure to share anybody who might be interested in it. And Nicholas, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Talk to you later.